going to take a look at 21 Moon. This is uh, a playtest first edition. <laughs> it's a beta edition of uh, uh, what is essentially an 18xx game. Um, the designer states that it's 18xx inspired. I take issue with that. It is more 18xx than 2038 or Poseidon, which are pretty much recognized as part of the family. Um, it does have its differences from sort of any of the main flavors of 18xx that are out there. It is its own little critter. Um, now, I'm going to be doing this as, as a play test. I've already played it through once, almost to the end. I'm actually not sure I will make it to the end here either. <coughs> the main reason being, uh, well, we'll see. <laughs> Calculations get painful at the end. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll try. But uh, yeah, it was pretty obvious who was going to win when I played it, and I, I didn't see that I was going to learn anything new playing it. Uh, without the video, we'll see. We'll see uh, how far, how, what, you know, whether I get to a point where it's not really. You know, there's not much more that I can add to the game. Um, so, this is my second attempt at playtesting a game on video. The first one was the troubles, and quite honestly, that wasn't ready. This, that wasn't ready for um, uh, what I can do with a game. Um, I, I, I don't have the capability to, you know, really spend a whole hell of a lot of time on any given game. But this one is pretty darn close to, you know, a publication type point, right? It's a matter of shaking out a few little issues. Uh, so, you know, I was able to read the rules and while there may be errors in them, while there may be things that are going to change, or not, you know, uh, while there are places where there's omissions that needed to be filled in, a couple little questions to the designer got, uh, got me the information I needed for where the intentions were, at least. Some of this stuff is still being worked on, um, but at least I kind of was able to, I was able to read this and understand how to set up the game, how to play it, more or less. <laughs> And so, you know, this is in a much, much finer, uh, a, a position that's fitting for what I'd call a blind test. And that's probably what I'm most suited for. I, I'm not really someone, to, first of all, you have to, you know, you have to send the game out uh, to me and then I have to work with it. But I also have a lot of trouble cooperating with people heavily. <laughs> Which is why I play things alone. No? Um, okay, so I am going to still cover this in the promotional style or whatever, the expositional style, I guess, where uh, I'm also showing the game to generate some interest uh, as well. But unlike most of my video coverage, a lot... Yeah, I do this anyway with published games, but I'm going to be focusing even more on, hey... This is weird. This is something that I think, um, you know, maybe needs to be filled in a little better. Uh, factors like that. So it may actually take me longer to get through the rules uh, than I normally would. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the board, etc. You know, just to give that expositional part of the introduction. So first of all, you've got seven different companies and they've got their own holding boxes here as well as their corporate uh, certificates. One thing you'll immediately notice is the smaller, these are the share uh, cards. Um, they're less attractive. They are a little difficult to deal with in some ways. You know, they're a little harder to pick up or whatever, but they take up a lot less space. And that's going to allow me to play this on what is maybe a smaller space than I would want to play an 18xx game with this size board. Uh, on because it is a rather large board. Uh, at least it looks it to me. I don't know. Yeah, everything looks so big in here. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, you've got every corporation has pretty much the same pieces. It has a large piece, which is going to be the home base. Uh, and then it's got uh, smaller pieces, one to use on the stock track, 
and then the others are going to be something called depots, which are basically just uh, your normal base tokens. Uh, home base has to be differentiated a little bit so that when the tiles are out, you're going to be able to more easily identify that that space is a home base space. <coughs> because what you'll notice is there's these mineral resource spaces. And we'll get to them in a moment. Let me just keep working my way through. You have these choo-choos, and they're, they're kind of a pretty idea instead of the cards. Um, I'm a little surprised <laughs> at it. It's sort of like, yeah, at the playtest level, uh, we're going, going with, you know, some really kind of higher quality pieces than your normal 18xx game. Um, these are player tokens. Uh, they're going to be to indicate your stock round order. Uh, one of the things I often have as a gripe in general, and I think I don't express it on every 18xx, but it's that, hey, your initial seating order is really, really important in XX games. Well, in this one, and I think 1880 does something similar as well, uh, but I don't really recall. <laughs> I've only played it a couple of times, um, although it is one of the more recent ones I've played. It's been a while. Uh, in this one, the entire seating order gets shaken up each each uh, each stock round essentially, um, and that is done again without luck. This game has a little bit more luck than most eighteen XX games. Uh, your seating order is important, and that'll affect your order on your first bids. Um, but then nothing else is based on that for the rest of the game. Eh. Yeah, basically. Um, there's, yeah, but there's these cubes, and these are different types of minerals that you can find in these red spaces. They're going to be your cities in this game, essentially. Yeah. Uh, however, they have a, a certain complex relationship, which is expressed by this chart. Okay, so what's going to be happening, and we'll, we'll go in more detail in the rules, um, What's going to be happening is that these are randomly taken and placed at the beginning of the game. Okay, and that's the type of mineral that's available in a particular location. And these minerals are going to have, first of all, there's different numbers of each one. And they have a name, which is kind of unimportant. But they have different values depending on the color of the tile that they're sitting on, how advanced that tile is. Uh, I think this is meant to re represent largely resource depletion or valuation based on, you know, uh, how heavily the mining operation is going or, or whatever you want to call it. Um, so some of them, like the black, uh, start out fairly cheap and then increase to a very high value. Others, like yellow, start out very valuable early in the game but they can decrease. Now, they will not decrease if nobody increases uh, the track color. So, like in all XX, uh, or most X, X games, you have your yellow tile track, green tile track. It uses opposite coloration, um, and I understand why. Brown tile track and gray tile track uh, with their normal uh, meanings in the game. Yeah. Well, the expected meaning in an 18xx rail game. Um, e and so, you know, if you leave a yellow tile on the yellow cube, it keeps the same value throughout the game at 40, uh, 40 bucks per hit. But if more, you know, if people are upgrading that tile, instead of getting more valuable, as most XX games, all cities get more valuable usually, these actually decrease, which is kind of weird. And then you have, uh, there's a couple of these rare white magnetite, which are not very valuable at all. They're always worth 10. So they're basically like doinkers. What does this allow you to do? Well, what it means is, um, well, first of all, it adds an extra layer of complexity as to how the valuations are going to go, what your roots are going to be, you know, what your root planning is going to be. So if you look at one of these and you see it's in a location that's kind of important, um, you may count that it's going to probably change colors 
in order to allow more people in, etc., which will mean its value decreases. So it may be very good to hook up early in the game, but you may not be able to count on it being there all the time. The others largely operate um, as cities do in most XX games where you're going to want to upgrade them as fast as possible, except the Magnetite, which you don't want to. And the base camp, okay, remember, you've got a base camp piece that's a little different. Those won't have cubes. Those relate to starting locations for the corporations. Um, the base camp also will decrease as it becomes more and more used. Uh, and again, you can probably do some kind of hand wavy explanation as to what that is. I mean, XX always has hand waving going on in it. In this case, you can see it as well. You know, it's becoming such an important hub that uh, prices in general are lower there. And I don't know how much sense that makes. You know, usually resources uh, out in the hinterlands are worth less. It's transporting them closer and closer that makes them more valuable, but I don't know. Uh, I'm really not sure, you know, how, how to put that. Um, other pieces of information that you have. So on the, tra on the uh, board itself, you have some terrain. So first of all, the mineral resource spaces always cost you to enter, and you have terrain uh, that's like rough terrain in most games. You have the rocket launch pad, which is a very special space. Uh, and then you have this rift here, which is basically an impassable, uh, impassable division between spaces, but one of the private companies is gonna be able to build across that. You also have some special long routes some games have this. Uh, if you connect up, you know, say green to, to orange, which is this connection, you get 50 extra bucks if you make the run completely from here to here with a single train until gray tiles come out, at which point you'll get 70 extra. Now these come out when, uh, when you first hit the brown tiles, and that's the only time when these are available. But uh, good luck getting a train to run between them earlier. You'd really have to, to work on making a horrible route overall. And of course, these are off-board locations, so they're endpoints. Um, this is kind of weird, and we'll look at it. I'm not sure I have the rules completely understood on it, but I think what happens is in one operating ground, it is a location that you can only enter, and after that, it becomes a pass-through location. Uh, which means you can hit it twice uh, when it's special, uh, if, I, if I understand it correctly. We'll see when I get through the rules. Um, again, so you got two little rocket ships. One's to mark where you are in the game in terms of which turn you're in. Again, like in 1880 and a couple of others, this has a fixed um, number of operating in stock rounds in the game. Uh, the game will go X number of turns, rounds, whatever you want to call it, X number of uh, rounds, and then it ends and you calculate your value. There is no way to get around this. The rules is written. If a player goes bankrupt, they're out of the game and you keep playing. If two players go bankrupt, there doesn't seem to be an exception for that either. Uh, there might be some optional rules coming on that, we'll see. And um, also, notably, the bank, no, no silly paper money in this, I've, I've become a, a devotee of using poker chips, especially these mini chips, I love them. Um, uh, the bank has a fixed size, but there are no rules about why it's a fixed size, so... Uh, again, I may see that's different, but I have a pile of uh, money out there that I pulled out of my poker chips up, but I honestly don't think it matters. I think as long as you have at least, and it's 6,000 credits um, of money available, you're okay. Uh, what I have here is 6,000 credits of money, ones, fives, 25s, 100s. These are 500s, but they're not in play. I just didn't want to pull them out of the box. I'm not going to use them, except, you know, I don't know. <laughs> except that they don't matter. Um, okay. What other information do you have here? Uh, 
What does this explain? Power source lifespan, first buy scraps. Okay, so this, yeah, this has to do with what trains you have available. So, um, and it's wrong according to the rules. I don't know which one is right. The rules themselves, uh, I believe, say that the maximum number of transports is actually three per company. And that'll last through the first three train types. And then the second three train types, you're only allowed two trains per corporation. However, the way trains are bought in this is a little bit more relaxed than most XX games. You are allowed to buy a train if it would kill um, other trains that are maybe taking up uh, your position. So let's say this is three and you have this, which looks horrible. Uh, and somehow you get enough money to buy one of these. Normally in an XX game, you would not be able to buy that um, that train that goes over the limit. Now, that limit is three, according to my knowledge. But in this case, let's change that. In this case, since the five train would be killing a yellow train, you would be allowed to buy it, killing the yellow train, and then you would be over the limit and you would have to discard a train. Uh, in this scheme, discarded trains don't go into the bank pool, they are dead. Scrapped. Uh, let's look at what else we have. Kind of explain this chart. Stock market is an 1830 style stock market. Uh, one difference between it and normal stock uh, and the 1830 stock market is your payout determines how far you're going to go forward. I'm just giving you the teasers here. We'll work through the rules because that's kind of important, but um, you have to pay out at least your stock value. Or is it 50% of your stock value? We'll see. Uh, I think it's your stock value. No, uh, you have to pay out at least 50% of your stock value in order to move forward one space and you have to pay out 200% of your stock value to move forward two spaces. And that should be specified on here, I believe. One step when for dividend less than two times current stock price. That's, that's not exactly right. It does have the minimum. You have to get at least half. And that's expressed here on the third one here. And two steps if you're higher than twice the current stock price. Uh, you can only go a multiple of two. I remember there was a game where you could like go out at least a multiple of three or four that was really shockingly powerful. Um, but you can get a pretty good jump on this if you you know swallow for a while and then come out with big trainage. Uh, the track, oh boy. So the track is shocking. Yeah, the yellow is not so shocking. They look pretty normal. Um, the only thing is there's not a lot of them. There's very few of some of them. <laughs> and that is a design limitation uh, very specific in this game. The, the trackways, they're called roads in this, are um, a very, very tight commodity. This is not a tiny board, and there isn't a lot. Uh, and the reason for that is given as the player, uh, the, getting materials to the moon is difficult. There's only so much road building material, so there will be more problems with getting them there. Now this is gonna cause us a very specific thing. So in most XX games, there come points in time where you're like, oh shit, I don't have a sharp turn and I need one. Or I don't have the exact green tile I need and there's only two of them in the game. Well, this game's harsher. <laughs> Much harsher. Not only is it there less of the yellows, the greens, there's very, very few. There's no more than one of any of the regular green tiles. The brown tiles, also very limited. And worse than that, the types of tiles are not what you'd expect. So you see this and you're like, oh, that's kind of cool. Yeah. Um, and so far, you know, this exists in some other games. Hey, some of these look pretty normal. Okay. Um, it's got some of the otter ones, but it doesn't have any preference. So there's one of everything, and you're not going to be able to use the ones that you think are more common. In most XX games, uh, you're not going to see multiples of them. 
but you do have a lot more flexibility and that that adds a little weirdness in there but when you get to the browns okay okay these are believable hey not quite two of the same no um okay that's a weird one there are ones that are just missing that are in almost every 18xx game so for example the one here that has additional connections that's not here um so that's kind of interesting uh i found a number of cases where there was no chance to upgrade uh, because not only, maybe something was missing or um there was just nothing that could replace certain green tiles uh, that normally you would think, oh, that should be easy. Now, I was really hard and really, really harsh. Um, now, there's no tile manifest. I don't know that there needs to be. And there's no numbers on the tiles, which, you know, you can't have the person who's the 18xx expert. Give me a 542, please. Wow. I'm always like, what? <laughs> you know, somebody calls these a number eight, and I'm like, huh? <laughs> I think that's it. Uh, how about a straight <laughs> so that everybody understands it anyway um, then you have private companies private companies like it in 1830 but these private companies are a little winky um, the weird thing about these is that they don't all just go away at one time and they don't generally all follow rules so uh, 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 they don't follow a general set of rules for the most part um, they do to some extent but they each have very special parts about them which means you have to assess things uh, you have to assess each one in a little bit more care than just you know walking in with your kind of 1830 mindset or whatever and expecting the game to play along that way it does in many other ways you know the train rusting and everything all right shall we and i want to take some care on this so it may actually we'll see if it takes me longer than normal um a fair amount of introduction in here uh, the setup for the game, I believe, I've largely explained. Again, these are randomly distributed on the mineral resource spaces. And what's really neat about that is it creates a different game each time. There's your randomness. It's in that initial setup. Between that and, the, and who gets the first player, that's all you got. Okay. Um, except for me, because I'll be rolling dice for decisions. <coughs> Excuse me. And my Corona. My nine Coronas. Um, okay. Uh, each person gets an investment marker. They're shuffled at the beginning of the game and ordered here. And I'm not going to exactly do that. I'm going to have a preset order for the first turn of the game because, you know, whatever <laughs> doesn't make a difference okay then you go through a bidding round on the six private companies uh the road tiles are sorted um there are seven pri uh I, I didn't explain these guys okay what do we got on here that's special you got a lot of information on here with the expectation that each person is going to have at least one of these including this chart um, this could actually probably be shrunk down, getting rid of some of that information. You have space to put your monies, your transports. You're going to be allowed to invest in other corporations with your corporation. Mm, I got a little bit of weirdness with that. That, that doesn't tend to do you much good in a game without uh, mergers. Um, but it does give you a place you can stick some money that can create more money. Kind of like, uh, what is it, 1870 also allows you to steal your shares back and take them out of play essentially in the corporation as a way to reserve some cash for later i don't feel like it's as useful here though and then you have room for private companies that you sell to the corporations but at the beginning of the game these seven corporations are shuffled and one of them is removed from play it will come in later it shows up down here but you're going to have only six corporations available to start the game and more than that, there's no more than there's only five players ever allowed at the game. 
it's got a max number of players of five. So you got a couple little differences there. Um, the money is enough that everybody can start a corporation no matter what though. <laughs> because there are special rules for starting corporations that are kind of nifty. I, I like them. They allow everyone a chance. And then we have a bank that has a total value and there's no real reason. Oh, it says at least 6,000. Excellent. Excellent. So I can put all my money back in. Um, okay. Let's keep going through because I want to try to catch at least some of the places where I found things. So every game is 11 months to a sequence liftoff. Somebody's walking behind me. Um, when the freight rocket, Future One, which is over here, leaves the moon. Um, I gotta, I'm still nervous as hell because there's this weird shadow coming behind me and I don't know where it's from, but it's very nervous. <laughs> I have something behind me, I feel. Okay. Um, during the op operating round, public companies that have sold at least 50% of their shares are allowed to act. That's their float value on here. Uh, in between operating rounds, we hit fixed stock rounds. Um, again, it's a fixed sequence of play. So many operating rounds with stock rounds. No reliance on the trains for that. Um, and then we have a sequence of the entire game spelled out here. Now, let me look through this to see if there's anything that shocks me because some of these are issues there. Um, so a special rule, and this is covered. Uh, this, if you own this first private company here, the old landing site, um, you will immediately fall to be the last player in the first stock round, which immediately follows the auction um, for whatever reason. But otherwise, whoever has the highest amount of credits oh did I scoot this up okay whoever has the least cash on hand after a stock round ends up going first up here after the entire stock round is done and that includes the bidding round with the one exception that whoever bought this is going to end up going last now um, that's a big deal <laughs> I did it completely the opposite which may have skewed my first game because whoever buys this, remember there's at most five players. Well, there's six private companies. Whoever buys this is going to be guaranteed the right to have two private companies. Uh, if this was 1830, that's a pretty good deal. It's not so clear here <laughs> because this one's kind of weird. Okay. Um, Okay, but this goes the opposite. Uh, so I didn't change it that much. Here, whoever has the highest amount of money left at the end of the stock round, in the regular stock rounds, goes first. Which more closely represents how uh, things work in, say, uh, it's a person way back walking in front of the sun. Um, more closely represents the concept of priority in 1830, for example, because usually whoever passes first, well, whoever passes first might be doing so because they're out of money, but later in the game where it's most, where sometimes it's more important, whoever passes first is perhaps somebody who has their stock limits filled out. So whatever. But yeah, when, when you're, uh, at the end of the stock round, whoever has the most money goes up to the top. So I got that right for the, everything except the initial bidding round when I played. And then in between stock rounds, we have operating rounds where the uh, corporations take their turns operating based on share value as normal. Um, and I went with right, furthest right uh, as a tiebreaker just because I'm used to that. I assume the rules say that, but I don't remember. Okay, now as we keep going down, uh, no, this alternates. Jesus, wait a minute, what the hell? So highest amount acts first, lowest last, oh, this, this confuses me. In stock round five, so in the first 
bidding. Wow, I did not realize that. Um, in the first bidding, the lowest value goes first on the track, and in the second it's highest, then it's lowest. Wow, that's kind of annoying. Uh, then it's highest, then it's highest again, and it doesn't matter in operating in the third stock round, uh, in stock round one down here. Um, boy. So that's one of the things I have with this game is it causes a bit of confusion with some other things. And this one, wow, that one really kind of kills me. Um, and they do not spell out the order on here where it would be very useful to tell me, do they? I'm not even sure what this does me. It's only the first five. <laughs> oh, it's mixed in with, it's not mixed together with the operating rounds. Wow, that's really weird. Um, yeah, no, it avoids the operating rounds? I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't even really understand that. I think this is, you know, this is the order of one player's stock turn. Okay. <coughs> okay. So, yeah, um, that is annoying to me. I like it to be a fixed value, and I'm not sure why we go lowest once, twice. Wait, wait. Highest goes first. Highest goes first. I misread. Okay. So it's always highest goes first, except for right after the auction. All right. That makes sense to me. I just misread. All right. Give me too many words and I'm going to fuck them up. Okay. So for the auctioning, um, for the following, yeah, you're going to have to skip ahead while I do sort of playtesting level of like, you know, my level of playtesting, whatever that is, level of dig in and try to make sure I understand things correctly. Um, for the auction of the private companies, it works essentially the same as 1830. Um, that's my take on it. The rules aren't necessarily in favor of that. We'll see. The investor who has priority, i.e. whoever got first on there, um, may buy the lowest numbered private company that's still available at its price. Now these have uh, several pieces of information. They have a price, they have an income that they produce every operating round, and then they have a sell value, which you can sell to a corporation for. So this costs you 20, makes no income, and you can sell it to a corporation for anywhere between 1 and 10 credits. They can all basically be sold between 1 and twice their starting value, I believe, with the exception of this one. So that's a little weird. This one's a little special. <coughs> like I said, you may not want that one um, because it is kind of wanky. Um, okay, so you can bid, buy the lowest number private company. You can bid for another as yet unsold private company by placing five credits beside it, or you can pass. Okay, so a five credit marker beside it. Nothing in there tells you that you're reserving money on that bid but something later implies that. Uh, when an investor buys the first private company, the second becomes the new lowest number private. If the purchase of a lowest ranked private exposes the second lowest private, which already has one bid or more, uh, oh, well, one bid, the investor has to buy that private for the starting price plus five credits, okay? If there's more than one bid from several investors, an auction automatically begins until one advance investor has bought the private company according to the information below. This process is repeated until all privates are sold. If there are a lowest ranked private that all investors pass on, the initial price is reduced by 10. There's a number of grammatical issues here. One of the things, um, someone who knows 18xx uh, and is comfortable working with the designer is going to have to probably uh, do a copy edit job on this. Someone who has, you know, a stronger 
stronger holding on, on English. The English is fairly good on this. I don't feel like there's a, lo a lot of misunderstandings, but there are places where if this is going to be sold commercially, eh, you would want it a little better. Anyway, that, that is one of them. Uh, or they could be just typos. I mean, I don't know. Uh, but my feeling is the way that they are, they feel more like uh, the difficulties in coping with the English grammatical <laughs> structure, which is really quite bizarre at times. Um, uh, uh, so the initial price is uh, reduced by 10 credits per turn until an investor has bought the private. In the event the value of the private would drop as low as zero, the investor gets it for free. No statement that someone must take it. Uh, I'm not sure why you wouldn't, but uh, because in 1830, there's a reason not to take the, the uh, private, um, even if you get it for free. Like, you might not want it because of priority. There's no such factor in here. Now, what's not noted in here is the bidding. We have another one here. Let's see what this says, because maybe, I'm, maybe I just uh, skimmed through this too much. A bid for a private company not yet offered for sale must exceed the face value of the company by at least five credits. You place the bid money beside. Okay, so this is different. This one says place five credits beside it. This says you put the bid money beside the crow, uh, the private company card on the table, and then it's not available to you. So uh, see it as a clarification, but the, the contradiction has to be cleaned up. Any number of players may bid for the same company. A player gains no benefit from bidding twice on the same company. Uh, that's not entirely true in 1830 and probably not here. Sometimes it might be to your value to put another bid on a company because you might not get the first chance to put that, that particular bid on it. Um, okay. Uh, if there's more than one bid from several investors, an auction immediately begins. Uh, no, I jumped. A company which has been bid on is not offered for sale in the usual way. Instead, once the company preceding it has been sold, the auction procedure is halted. If only one bid has been received, the company sold for its starting bid, starting value plus five. If several investors made bids, an auction is held in which all bidders, but no one else takes part. The starting price for the auction is the highest sum bid, and the minimum raise is five credits. So what's not specified here is that the raises take place um, during your normal bidding. Uh, during your initial bids on a company, uh, when you do it before you're actually in the auction. Um, I think that's intended. Uh, it's only a minimum raise of five credits. You can go off of, you can move it, you know, you could raise by seven. It's not multiples of five, which is the same as 1830, but that's kind of a tricky thing. Um, an investor purchasing a company by auction may use the money he or she is already staked in the original bid to make the purchase. Unsuccessful bidders are now free to use the money set aside as their bid again. That's an implication that it works exactly like 1830. Play then reserves with the investor next in line. Um, so this needs to be cleaned up a little bit in wording. Um, this auction will go on until all six private companies are bought by investors. Notably, the game does not move forward until these are all sold. Uh, in 1830, it's allowed to do that because there's no limit to the number of stock and operating rounds. Here, it would be really weird. You know, you, you buy the privates and then, hey, you can't buy any corporations and then you do two stock round, uh, two operating rounds and then you go to the next stock round. No, it doesn't work that way in this um, because of the fixed uh, level, the, the fixed sequence of play for the entire game. Okay. Each of the six private companies have their own special rules. And yeah, this is going to take more than one video because I'm doing the playtest stuff along with it. I would spring through them. Okay. I believe these say the same things on them. An investor holding the old landing site can sell it to a public uh, company for an agreed upon price between one and 10 credits. That's covered in here. Uh, after buying the private, the investor may get the black says plus SD, it just says SD here, on any mineral hex on the board. And remember, these will already have their cubes on them, okay? Um, if you get a public company, which you probably will, uh, later on, and you buy the old landing site with that public company, you can use this as a special supply depot for that co corporation. And here's what's cool, that will put you uh, you might be starting over here, but now you have a supply depot here, so it's like 
uh, the Delaware and Hudson in 1830. It gives you a jump into that area, but it doesn't give you free track lay or anything like that. Um, when a yellow tile is built, the token will occupy the SD spot, which is the circle on the space, and continue to do so during upgrades. The token acts as a slot blocker for all public companies until being sold as an additional supply depot. Until being sold as an the token ads. I do not understand that. I do not know what's being worded there. I assumed this sat there as an SD. The public company can use this as a supply depot during the game. Yeah. For all public companies until being sold as an additional supply depot. I just don't understand what's being said there. Uh, I, I think that line is an error. The way I see it is this is an extra token for that corporation. It's possible that's not what's meant. This line throws that into doubt. It's possible you may have to replace it with one of your things and actually pay the money to do so. Uh, but it says it can use it as a supply depot. Now, um, if it's intended to not be an extra token, but merely a placeholder, so that you can buy a token there, that becomes a lot less powerful. Because one of the advantages to this is it gives you an extra token on the map. The difficulty with that is this is a black piece and it's not your corporation piece. So I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna play it the way that line indicates it, which is this is a placeholder. Does it say it's a placeholder anywhere? I don't believe so. It's a slot blocker for all public companies until being sold as an additional supply depot. So I think the intention, and this is not how I played it before, so let's say LP owns uh, the old landing site, it can buy its supply depot there. So it doesn't actually act as a supply depot, it acts as a location that can be that is a reserved supply depot. Uh, please note the investor who buys the old landing site will automatically move to the last spot when determining the SR6 turn order. Okay. Oops. All right, the second one is the UN contract. Uh, the investor can keep the UN contract or sell it to a public company for an agreed price between 1 and 50 credits, twice the price. Uh, as agreed with the president of the company. The owner gets a one-time bonus of 80 credits. That owner being the corporation, I believe, when connecting a road to an off-map location. Um, when this is done, the UN project starts, which results in a UN transport pur purchase at the start of operating round four. And then you discard the contract at the end of operating round five, which is before operating round four, or when the bonus is collected. So the bonus is that 80 credits. If you don't get that 80 credits, this isn't gonna go here, and that's how I would mark it, indicating that a single, the next train in line is going to be, um, when you reach that operating, the beginning of that operating round, is going to be scrapped at that point. That's what this does. A UN initiative without about building a permanent base on the moon acquires the cheapest transport available, OR5, which is taken out of play. This is the last thing that happens during OR6, uh, but may cause older transports to be depleted and must therefore immediately be removed from the game. Yeah, okay. So it can create a phase change. I don't know about that OR6 thing. Um, hmm. I think if you do not sell this to a corporation and, no, or, <laughs> well, if you do not sell it to a corporation, I think the UN contract never happens. If you sell it to a corporation, you have to hook up an off-map supply box, uh, an off-map location with road, get your 80 credit bonus, and that is the only case where this will trigger a train change. So it gives you some interesting control over the train rush. Um, that's my interpretation of it. This does need to be clearer. Um, 
the spaceport. The player owning the spaceport, this one seriously needs some clarifications. I had to discuss this one. Uh, Owning the spaceport should sell it to a public company. Should? <laughs> Is that, you know, here it's, they can keep it or sell it. Here it's, they should sell it to a public company for an agreed price between one and 80 credits. Again, twice the price. Um, only the company owning the spaceport can build the yellow road tile on this space. And they may do it at no cost as an extra tile lay on any operating round. Um, the company opening, owning the spaceport do not have to have a clear road between the base camp and the launch pad before liftoff. This is the thing where the rules don't make it clear what that means. Um, there is essentially something not yet written into the rules that I have. And I did discuss this. The intention here is that at the end of the game, all the companies are going to have to connect to here at some point in the game. And what the designers are leaning towards right now is that you make one run into or through the rocket launch pad that collects the income from that, which can only happen starting with operating round six. And you get some kind of marker or something that says you will not be penalized. It's kind of like bell ringers in 1870 again, um, but working in a different direction. Whoever owns the spaceport gets control of this hex with a free placement if they wish it, but they also will never have to reach there. Um, and what this is to indicate is transport of your minerals to here. Now, the what happens if you don't reach there is still kind of up in the air. The current idea is you have to have hit it once during the entirety of the game. And if you do not manage to do that, you lose 10 spaces on the stock track uh, at the end of the game. There's no way they can affect your income throughout the game uh, that the corporations are making, which is in a way maybe what would make sense. But uh, if you have not hooked it up uh, and, and made a run there, uh, you've got, a, you know, all the resources aren't actually being sold. So you take a big stock hit um, because this one rocket that is delivering the resources is of key importance to the game. Okay, let's keep going. Uh, the next one is the research lab. You can sell this between 1 and 120, again, up to double price. Uh, the owner can start, uh, can, at the start of an OR, place this plus 20 credits marker on any resource marker on the map. That resource will be at plus 20 bucks through all the different color changes or whatever, beyond what it's normally worth for everyone. That has to be very carefully done. When I played it, I threw it here. That turned out to be a really dumb place because everybody could hit it when it was really valuable. <laughs> so you kind of want to hide it away where you're going to need it. Um, here, yeah, everybody needs this, but just because you have a token there doesn't mean people can't hit it because they can run through this later in the game. Um, when you place that marker, it closes this out, which means that income of 10 per turn goes away. So that's kind of a big deal because those kind of incomes are kind of useful. So you may not want to throw this down as soon as you want. Now notice, this private company and the spaceport, these don't go away. Uh, at the end of a particular time. The others, the UN contract did, I don't, I don't know about this one. Uh, this one I don't believe does. This one doesn't do you much except giving you this SD marker. Um, and it doesn't produce income, so it can be discarded when it's done. Okay, the space bre uh no, let's go to the tunnel company. That's the next one. Uh, it can be sold from between one and 200 credits. And we're getting to the expensive one here. This one gets you an income of 20 per turn. Um, the investor gets a 10% share without cost in the company it's sold to, as long as that corporation uh, still has one available in its initial offering. We'll talk about initial offerings later. They're different than what you're used to. Again, I think kind of 1880-ish. This game seems to share more with 1880 than anything else I can think of. Uh, the company owning the tunnel, or my memory of 1880, maybe not the reality. Uh, the company owning the tunnel company can build yellow rolled tiles 
the starting tiles, in mountain spaces, those are the dark gray 40 buck ones, by paying only 10 credits instead of 40. But once the first five transporters are uh, bought, first brown train, you know, first brown tile train, these orange guys, um, this gets discarded, it'll no longer provide income, it no longer gives its bonus. And then we go to the Space Bridge Company. Uh, when you buy this, you can select a 10% share in either Space Mining or Mining Alliance. Okay, if you own this, in one of those two, as soon as the presidency is sold, uh, somebody starts the company, not floats it. Uh, the investor sells the Space Bridge Company to that public. Now here it says should sell to public company for an agreed price between one and 240 credits. Um, again, I think that's completely an ad option. The company owning the Space Bridge Company, uh, the corporation should be, these, they should distinguish between corporations and companies, can build yellow road tiles crossing the rift just as normal. Okay, not sure what that means. I know what is intended here. Um, nothing crosses the rift. What they mean, I believe, is that track entering uh, running into the rift, okay? Which is important because you should not be able to do any upgrades that point off the rift or anything like that during your build phase unless you have this. This is not well worded if that's the case because the Space Bridge Company should be able then to say upgrade this to this, which I don't believe is spelled out on there. If they're not allowed to do that, then this is always permanently blocked once you play this. Um, so again, that's something the designer would have to choose. Once a yellow road tile is built, any company can run transports over the bridge, paying 10 credits per transport to the owner. Well, this is interesting. This does not have that piece of information. And nowhere else has it. I don't know which one applies. Um, I forgot about the rule, <laughs> but had noted it when I was reading the rules that there was a difference between the two. Um, and the SBC runs out of supply and is discarded at the end of operating round four over here. And again, you know, some things end in five, six, four, or whatever. So these, some of them never end. So that, that's kind of interesting. Selling private company to onwards, uh, just to a public company is fine, except that should be corporation. Private companies may be sold to a public corporation for a mutually agreed price with the president of the buying public corporation at any time during the buyer or seller's turn of stock round two, three, and four only. Okay? That's weird. Oh, stock round. Okay, so yes, it, this is weird. You do not buy private, uh, private companies during your operating round. You buy them during your stock round. And this is one of those little, you know, hey, what's the big deal with that? Um, that I feel causes some serious problems. The reason it causes problems is I'm running my corporation. That's when I get my cash from the corporation. Uh, that's when I do my planning and when I'm used to it. And now the game has done something that probably is just as viable but is harder um, to remember, and players are not gonna be used to doing the thought process of setting up their corporation to have the money to buy stuff during the stock round. Now, there are multiple things they can buy during the stock round, though, so I think it is kind of important because you're allowed to invest in shares during the stock round. So like 1870, where you make the decision um, to buy, the other game that this that seems to come up with this one, that buy um, their own shares back using their cash that you have to plan for. In this case, you also have to plan for when you're going to buy your uh, your private corporations. Now, you're not allowed to do it here, and it's a big deal uh, in a sense because what this allows you to do that's different that I think. Other XX players like me are more used to <coughs> and, and, and ready to, to think about is, um, hey, I need some cash. I'm going to buy private corporation right now when I start 
or a private company when I start a corporation. Okay, this is done on any player's turn who's the buyer or seller. Now, who's the buyer? Well, presumably the president of the corporation. Again, not, not really fleshed out as much as possible, but whatever. Okay. Um, let's get a little bit more in. Let me pause again because I have to put pack this video together anyway, so I might as well give myself a little rest. So let's keep working through. Now, this is page seven out of four of these. <laughs> okay. Um, so now we're looking at the different stages of the game, which are, as usual, in an XX, handled by the Chi Chi's. Uh, let's see what we have here. I'm just, I have to work through the rules with sort of a, a fine tooth combed because part of what I'm looking for is discrepancies, whatever. Um, Transfer to play. <laughs> All very standard there. The particular trains, so a maximum of four. Oh no, I was wrong. Okay, so this is actually right. Four trains per company. I thought it said three somewhere. I can't remember where. Uh, the green tracks become available with the three train, as usual. It's really an 1830, uh, except instead of a diesel, you have a 10 train. You have less two trains, I think. And that's, otherwise, I think it's the same. Um, last two trains make sense because you have one last company. And there is actually a restriction on how many trains you can buy with a company at a time. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, I think it all, all works out there. So no diesel is, I guess, the big magic thing. Although the 10 is sort of like a diesel. I mean, you usually don't do more than 10. Um... All right, so there are seven different public companies. Let me just randomly out of the game at the beginning period. Um, they float when 50% of their shares are in investor or open market hands. Okay. Um, they have different locations marked on the map. Get rid of this crap. And remember, because of the randomization, of the cubes, you can't really tell the values of the companies until you sit down and actually start playing. Um, each each game is going to be a little different, which is kind of cool. Um, there's no exploration. It's all available at the beginning of the game. It's just how that map is going to play is different from game to game. Uh, you can agree to play a specific setup if you want. Um, okay. Now, they discuss the different minerals. None of this really matters. It's really flavor text. Some of it might need, you know, might need some thinking, you know, might need some copy editing or whatever. It's this chart that matters. Um, and one thing that's very key, although it wasn't immediately obvious to me, was when I first read the rules, I kind of thought maybe it was the period of the game that affected what the prices were, which kind of makes more sense in terms of, hey, this stuff's valuable at this time, this stuff's valuable at that time. It's easier to justify what's going on, but no, it, it is as the hex, as the uh, roads in the hexes uh, upgrade. That changes the prices, in some cases up, in some cases down. Okay, that's kind of the base concepts of the game, much of which I already went through. Um, during stock rounds, what do you do? Uh, first, a player has an option to sell as many shares as they like. Then they can buy, and this is different, up to two share certificates. Now it says either directly from a private company or from the open market. I think you can actually do one of each. Um, that's not, I think, specified here. Yeah, you know, they may buy either a certificate from a pack of answer. You got to be careful with the wording in English on these kind of things. Uh, then you're allowed to sell one or more of your private companies to a public company. This is during a stock turn, one player's turn. And then your turn is over. 
and the next player in the list goes. Okay. When all investors have finished one of their turns, each active public company, and that might have just happened, has the opportunity to do one thing. They can either sell or buy one share of another public corporation. They can buy it either from the open market or from the corporate uh, initial offerings. Now, one important thing about the initial offerings in this game, um, like an 80, there's no par value in this. Your stock values are always offered at the current stock market rate. So there's no arbitrage, you know, hey, this one's going up. What that means is only the player's desire to leave stocks in there um, impacts whether or not they move into the open market, you know, essentially. Okay. Um, so after that first turn and only the first set of stock turns, um, each of the public companies, corporations gets a chance, yeah, I have as much trouble as the rules do, has a chance to buy one certificate or sell a certificate. Um, they're allowed to hold a maximum of two in their hands. They could sell both of them, I believe. Uh, nope, only one at a time. Now, what's important here is they cannot hold their own certificates. And that's a big deal because there's also no mechanism to buy back their certificates. I find that a little weird. Uh, obviously, you wouldn't want them to be able to buy their own certificates the way they do in 1870. That creates a sort of a weird situation. But by only allowing them to buy other corporations' certificates, uh, there's not a lot of incentive to sink your money into the shares in that case. Whereas in 1870, you're sinking them into your own shares. That can increase your stock value because you're sold out, which is one of the effects here. And it also puts a reserve of capital that's going to grow rather than just sitting in the, in the credits. Now, in this case, you can still grow your investments in shares. The train rush is very fast, though, in this game, unlike in 1870. So there's less incentive to be buying the shares. And I do like the idea of corporations being able to buy back their own certificates. I don't know. Okay. Uh, simply for a number of reasons. And I like the 1870 model where that initial offering, they don't go back into the initial offering. They go into a hidden place where they don't count against the... Uh, against the shares available. Okay. Um, each investor is able to either buy a cert either a certificate from a pack of unsold certificates in the company, corporation, uh, and that money goes into the corporation treasury every time you buy from here. Or uh, you can buy stocks from the open market, in which case the money goes into the bank. Uh, if you sell any certificates, the certificates go in the open market there's no more than 5, 50% of the company in, in, of any corporation in the open market. And the cash comes into your hand. Now, an investor who has sold certificates in any company may not buy stock in the company during the same stock round, but needs to wait until a following stock round. This is where it's important to know the terminology. Stock round is an entire orange section. So if you sell, you can't buy back. That's pretty standard for 18xx. The investor cannot sell certificates in a public company during a stock round and sell shares again from the same company during the same stock round. Oh boy, uh, I do not like that rule. That means if you sell a certificate, then you're stuck. Now, here there's something else. Right? No, not here. You cannot buy shares from a corporation in which you sold shares. You cannot sell shares in a company you just bought shares in during the same stock round. Uh, these don't match. This one does. I don't like either of these rules. Uh, why do I not like them? Okay. The main reason? I'm not sure what their impact is. They prevent you from maybe doing as much wheeling and dealing with the stocks. But the main reason I don't like them is it is already difficult to keep track of, oh, fuck, what did I sell? Um, so what happens is when there's a corporate takeover or something like that, sometimes you're forced to sell your certificates 
and just because you don't want to be holding it and get the company dumped on you. And now you're put in a position where it's hard to remember which things you unloaded, you know. So you have you can keep track of it all on paper or record it on video the way I do, but it's not something I like. But there is definitely um, something is wrong here, right? Now, why would you want to prevent somebody from selling shares that they just bought? Well, the reason for that is, hey, I just invested in something. Oh, shit. Uh, I'm just trying to dump its stock price. So I buy up all the certificates and drop its stock. That's one of the manipulations in 1830 to try to jump around and get yourself a position on the, um, on the stock chart so that you go first. It's kind of a gamey move. People don't like it. I can understand that. Why would you not want somebody to be able to buy certificates that they already bought of that company? Okay, that's an interesting one. Um, that will limit how hard you can float a corporation. That's the one reason that might be implied. It's not clear which, if any of these are intended, however, um, I'm probably going to throw them out just because they make playing the game too complex. They make remembering who has done what too complex. On the other hand, they might actually make things kind of easy for the simple fact that, hey, I bought shares in that corporation. I can't buy more. My stock rounds are going to be very, very simple. And I can just tilt the ones that I bought. If I sell shares, I still have to remember that. Um, but which one of these applies then? Sell any number of shares. You cannot sell them if you just bought them in the same stock round. Uh, I really don't like that because if I'm buying for a takeover, I could end up owning the company in the next stock round after it's been raped. And wow, that means you can't afford to try to take control of each other's corporations, which takes too much of the game away, in my opinion. The other one... Um, which is, uh, trying to find it. You may not buy stock. An investor who has sold certificates may not buy stock. That makes sense. That's the standard. However, um, let's see. Certificates cannot be bought in the same turn, uh, with the exception that two president certificates, yeah, two president certificates cannot be bought. Wait, uh, an investor cannot sell certificates in a public and sell shares again during that same company during the stock round. Again, I don't understand this one. If I sell certificates in a corporation, I drop its value. Now, maybe I need to do that to protect my corporation. Now, again, I have to, I have to predict entirely how much money I'm going to need, how, much, how many shares of my corporation I'm going to need at the end of the stock round to prevent anyone from taking it over. Again, that's on a level of planning I just don't like in terms of the playability. Um, and tracking, it's going to be difficult. So those are my two feelings about either of those rules. I really, really dislike the not being able to sell shares that you bought, if that's true. <laughs> um, and, and this optional is, that's an option for the player. It's not like this is an optional rule there. Okay. Uh, the stock rounds keep going until everybody passes, basically. Um, you can come back in after you've passed, just like any 18xx. Uh, and then you determine the stock order for the next stock round based on the amount of credits they have left. The investor with the most amount of credits gets the priority spot and will act first. Uh and down. Now, does that match? Again, these charts aren't always in alignment. And so, again, I'd like to, you know, think about what I'm looking at. Now, here, lowest amount last. I think it's always, no, highest goes last. Yeah, see, the, now these alternate, and here it doesn't. So I just go highest to lowest, because that's what this rule says. But again, the charts are different from what the rules say. It's a matter of, uh, I don't know if it's sloppiness or one was used and then they switched the rules in one place, but not in both. Um, but I prefer the higher to lowest. Um, either one makes sense. Giving the person with the least cash on hand the first chance to go, the advantage of that 
is, uh, well, this is a person who probably spent almost all their money. So this is kind of a disadvantage. They maxed out what they could buy. And now they're going to get the first chance at the best stock available next time, which might be a private, uh, a corporation presidency or whatever. The other side of it is if, um, Okay, so they're also, though, likely to have the least money and likely to be able to make the least stock purchases total. So giving them the best choice might be some kind of balancing feature. But cash on hand doesn't really mean anything about game balance or whatever. So it's not really, and it's cash on hand before the operating rounds go. So it's not any kind of balancing feature for the person who is doing the worst overall in the game in terms of the runs that are going on. So I don't really see any advantage to that. Um, highest first, again, there's not much advantage to it at all, but by being the highest first, it means you've withheld the most money. You kind of, it makes sense that in, in a capitalist uh, market society that the person with the most money actually has the most choice. Um, so I kind of go with that. All right, let's keep going. Public corporation stocks. Um, one company is withdrawn from the game for the first few stock rounds until three. Uh, their split is 10% shares with a 20% uh, president certificate, all pretty standard. Uh, whatever money is bought goes in here. Once you've sold 50% of the corporation to investors and the open market, the corporation floats. Okay. Uh, the stock market tracks the current value. Uh, let's take a look at these. When the company pays out dividends, it'll go forward in this direction. When it fails, it goes backwards. Uh, bu, 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 bu. And also, selling stocks drops the price. Having stocks sold out will raise the price. Stock market is a key ingredient. This is all standard. A lot of words here that aren't really necessary to an 18xx standard player. And... Uh, companies can go bankrupt and then are removed from the game. Um, that is not defined. In particular, there's no rule about entering here that I've seen that causes bankruptcy. Players can go bankrupt. The rules that involve that do not say the corporations do, but in my interpretation of the rules, I say the corporation goes bankrupt and the, takes the player down with them. And that happens when there's forced train sales that don't work. Okay, initial stock price, when an investor buys a certificate, they have to announce a par value, which isn't really a par, it's one of these three, 90, 80, 70, or 60, and it's just the value that they pay for the president's certificate. Now, remember, they're allowed to buy two certificates at once, so they can buy 30% of the corporation, setting the price there, and, gets more interesting, um, all additional prices, all, all additional prices will always be on the current market value of the corporation. Now, during the stock round, as the president's share, now this is really interesting. This is a stock round, not stock turn. This should be stock turn, I think, but that's how I played it. During the same uh, stock round as the president's share is bought, because otherwise you can kind of do it at any time, is bought in the company, the president can sell up to an equal number of shares from the company to the open marker as the investor acting as president owns himself, herself, to generate more money into the company treasury. Now, maybe it's any time during the stock round um, when, you, when you first buy the presidency. Uh, that makes things a little more complicated. Um, as an exception to the normal rules of selling stocks, this does not move the stock value at all when this is done. Well, uh, buying, okay, you're selling them from the corporation. Um, as far, this is weirdly written, and this can only be done once per company and is not available during later stock rounds. As far as I can tell, the reasoning behind this is to float a corporation with very few shares. So for example, if I buy those three shares, uh, uh, say at 90, I pay 270 bucks, I can throw three more shares of that corporation into the open stock market. Now, here's the question. If I buy five shares over the course of the stock round, is the fact that this says stock round 
meaning this is not how I played it before. Does that mean that I can wait till some other point in the stock round and release five shares into the open market? I don't know. The big bonus to this is these generate cash from the bank into the corporate treasury. So you can pull all the cash from the corporation in by throwing certificates in there. Now there's a disadvantage to that. Stocks that are in here pay the corporation when it runs. they are stocks that the corporation has not yet uh, sold, so they get the dividends for them. Stocks that are in the open market, unlike 1830, but something that makes more sense to me in a lot of ways, um, pay to the bank, i.e. the dividends don't really go anywhere. Um, okay, let's take a look at stuff. Uh, all right. We are going, we have a couple of pages of stock stuff left. So I am going to stand here and I'm going to load this one up. This has been an hour and I think we have another hour of video. Now, obviously I could have introduced the game and gone through all the rules much, much quicker. Uh, if this was a game on the market, that's what I'd be doing. But <laughs> I'm trying to get across as much information um, to the designer about uh, my feels. Uh, and my feels <laughs> as I'm doing this because this is the only format that I can really um, get information across and I no longer have the capacity that I once had back when I was you know in my 30s <laughs> where you know I just wrote page after page after page of questions on a couple of games and details and stuff like that um, and most of which were really just like oh there's an ambiguity here there's an ambiguity here um, I'm not a person who's really good at being able to figure out game balance issues. And I'm certainly not going to be able to do that in the course of one play. It would take me 10 to 20 plays to really pin that down. There may be locations on the map that are not as fair as others. Hey, every 18xx game it has an asymmetrical, you know, has asymmetrical positioning of the corporations. Things that you have to make decisions and try to figure out how you can capitalize them on them. And in this game, with the randomization of these uh, mineral types, I don't think that there's anything that you can just flat out say, this is a better position than that. In particular, sure, it may be better to be closer to the rocket launch pad in general, because the advantages to being next to one of these is pretty low, as far as I can tell, so far. Um, it may be advantageous not to be near the rift, you know? <laughs> Uh, obviously, there are advantages to not having lots of expensive terrain near you where you build. Well, but that's what the game is. And you have to take that comparison in place with where the cubes are. Some, some cube placements may make certain corporations just clearly more valuable than others. That's life. All right, let me send this one up.